As you can hear the bombs now, they are hitting. Harlan sat down in front of the television, fairly certain that the world was now changed forever. Not to mention our way of learning about it. None of us will ever forget. This is CNN. We need to get back to a balanced budget. Can you imagine what this country could do with $1.3 billion a day? My greatest fear is that this amendment does not represent change at all. Lawmakers debate the merits of a constitutional amendment to balance the budget. Is it a good idea or a political band-aid? A city in the heart of the rainforest. Is this progress or a sign of impending ecological disaster? And Ross Perot, did his company make more money than it should have from government contracts? This is The World Today with Frank Sesno in Washington and Catherine Cryer at the CNN Center. Thanks for joining us. We begin tonight with a debate on the floor of the House of Representatives at issue, how to balance the federal budget. Lawmakers are considering several proposals for a constitutional amendment requiring a balanced budget. None specify how the government should go about performing this balancing act. No word on spending cuts, no word on taxes. Today's debate has been pretty heated. Here's some examples. The folks that brought you the ice cream sundae diet now bring you a constitutional amendment to solve all our woes. It'll be painless, it'll be quick, we will reinvigorate our economy, if we only change the Constitution, well, let's take a look at what this will bring us. It will bring us government gridlock that'll make the four, last four years look like a swift operating machine. America does not trust its own Congress anymore. America knows that Congress will not and that it cannot control its spending. That's why poll after poll after poll shows that the American people want a balanced budget to the Constitution, and they want it now, not tomorrow, not next year. It was the first bill I introduced when I came to this Congress in 1979, along with the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Stenholm. Things were already bad then, but I never dreamed that we would soon have a $400 billion annual deficit piled on to a $4 trillion uh, total deficit today. Mr. Speaker, it's a disgrace. The blame belongs right here, and ladies and gentlemen, the American people know it, and you know it. Well, what happens if the Constitution doesn't work? Should we go and ask for the, a papal edict? Or maybe we should ask for leeches to be placed on every member who doesn't do the right thing in terms of decisions. Or maybe we ought to ask that we have a bomber fly over the Capitol and threaten to drop a bomb on the Capitol. I mean, how far do we stretch this? I have a great fear that my five-year-old grandchild's inheritance and that of her contemporaries is being robbed by our generation, not just by those of us who sit in this house or those who sit in the Senate of the United States, but all Americans who expect to buy now and pay later. The time is up. It is immoral for us to do so. It is as well irresponsible and unfair. Debate is expected to continue into the night with a vote set for tomorrow. Well, President Bush is pushing hard for an amendment that would require a balanced budget unless three-fifths of the members in each house vote otherwise. Today's campaign sent local TV stations a taped message in which the president makes his case for the amendment. We can't wheel and deal the deficit away. There's no easy answer that we can jot out on a blank sheet of paper to wipe out a deficit of that magnitude. A balanced budget amendment is real action and it will work. We should not be willing to risk our grandchildren's future on sound bites that merely sound real. The deficit is what's real. Congressional inaction is what's real. A constitutional amendment Mandating a balanced budget is what's needed. U.S. mayors are weighing in on the amendment debate. The U.S. Conference of Mayors today called on Congress to reject the amendment, saying it would hurt the nation's cities. Supporters of the idea often argue that the federal government should be required to balance its budget, since many city and state governments do so. 
And a programming note, CNN's Prime News will devote much of its time tonight to a discussion of the balanced budget amendment. Fewer calls will be taken. That's coming up at 8 p.m. Eastern. Iraqi opposition leaders blame outsiders for blocking efforts to unseat Saddam Hussein. They say, among other things, that Saudi Arabia, Syria, and Iran want Saddam out but cannot agree on his replacement. Well, the Iraqi leader has thrived on indecision or miscalculation by the outside world. And up to just weeks before the Gulf War, the U.S. was still giving him every benefit of the doubt. CNN's Ralph Begleiter has been sifting through newly declassified documents which underscore the point. Less than one month before Saddam Hussein's army rolled into Kuwait, State Department insiders were still hoping they could moderate Iraq's behavior by avoiding U.S. sanctions. An internal memo said new controls on exports to Iraq could have significant negative impact on legitimate U.S.-Iraqi commerce. Only weeks before the invasion, the U.S. thought Iraq's nuclear program was in full compliance with international safeguards. Just four months before Saddam's move into Kuwait, U.S. intelligence concluded fears of Iraqi aggression seem exaggerated. Only one month before Iraq crossed the Kuwaiti border, U.S. Ambassador to Baghdad April Glaspy assured Secretary of State James Baker in a secret cable Iraq was worn out after its war against Iran and that Iraq is not spoiling to open a second front. And just eight months before Iraq's invasion, secret State Department messages were giving other countries a green light to sell weapons technology to Iraq. At the same time, it was still State Department policy to approve U.S. exports of civilian equipment which had known military uses. We lost 370 Americans or so, several of them from my district. We have over 3,000 uh, people uh, wounded, and uh, that may have been a war that didn't have to happen uh, if we had sent the right signals earlier. Secretary of State Baker did send a strongly worded warning to Baghdad in April 1990, but it wasn't until three months later that Baker asked for new export controls against Iraq. Saddam invaded Kuwait eight days later. Earlier, Baker had lobbied for U.S. grain sales to Iraq, while intelligence reports suggested Saddam was buying weapons with money he didn't have to spend on food. What Iraq got is material grain and rice and other agricultural products. So how could the grain and rice turn to, to be uh, weapons? It's nonsense. The documents show the Agriculture Department was still pushing grain sales to Iraq just four months before Saddam's invasion. President Bush has admitted his policy toward Iraq was a mistake, even if it was intended to try turning Iraq into a helpful power in the Middle East. But congressional Democrats in an election year now portray that mistake as a major policy blunder they say is being repeated by Mr. Bush's friendly approaches to China and to Syria. Ralph Begletter, CNN, Washington. Late reports from Belgrade say a United Nations peacekeeping convoy has been attacked outside Sarajevo. The 30-man team was headed for Sarajevo Airport to evaluate how to reopen it to receive emergency aid for starving civilians trapped by fighting in the capital of Bosnia-Herzegovina. One UN team arrived at the airport earlier today. Reuters news agency says broken communications from Sarajevo make it difficult to confirm details of the attack on the convoy. Earlier today in Belgrade, thousands of students took to the streets demanding the resignation of Serbian President Slobodan Milosevic. Milosevic is often blamed for the ethnic wars that have fired Yugoslavia's disintegration. One day before a presidential visit, gunmen opened fire on U.S. soldiers in Panama with deadly results. Also next, the politics of the rainforest in Brazil pits politicians against preservationists. And later... This is a nice neighborhood, but a lot of people got the wrong idea about my neighborhood after the riots. A fresh perspective on the Los Angeles riots as seen by a 12-year-old boy living with the aftermath. Hi, I'm Fred Dresner, president of U.S. News & World Report. And if you call this toll-free number right now, we're not going to send you some cheap designer phone. Instead, we're going to send you something much more valuable. News you can really use. It's about your family, your home, your business. Absolutely free. Now there's help in dealing with the economic realities of the 90s. This exclusive video, Building Financial Success, can be yours free if you call now for U.S. News. It will teach you about money matters that matter to you. And like U.S. News, it will provide you with easy proven strategies you can use today. In a moment, you can find out more. 
Bart Simpson on the cover of Time? And why America loves the Simpsons? Are you really interested in those questions? At U.S. News and World Report, we're not. We're concerned about you. That's why we bring you news you can use. With issues on how to build your fortune, the best colleges for your kids, and how to get the best jobs for the future. All this plus how the news of the world affects you. Call now to subscribe to U.S. News and receive your video, Building Financial Success, hosted by financial planning expert Steve Crowley. This 40-minute video will guide you in making important decisions about career choices, retirement, investing, saving for college, home mortgages, and much more. You'll also get the companion book, Your Financial Planner, to help you reach your financial goals. This valuable video and book are not available in stores. Both are yours free with your paid subscription to U.S. News. Call now and you'll also get great savings, over 80% off the cover price. You'll get 30 weekly issues, including exclusive annual guide issues like these throughout the year. Pay four low payments of just $3.75 or use your credit card. Take it home, drive it around the block, kick the tires, and if you don't like it, send it back to us and we'll give you your money back. A great magazine, great savings, and the book and video are free. Call now, 1-800-245-0400. Gunmen opened fire on a U.S. military vehicle in Panama today, killing one soldier and wounding another. It happened in the town of Chilibre, about 30 miles north of Panama City. This follows two days of demonstrations in Panama against President Bush. The president is scheduled to stop in Panama tomorrow on his way to the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro. Contrary to some press reports, the White House says the U.S. will accept and sign the Rio Declaration at the Earth Summit. The Declaration is a general summary of environmental principles, but the Bush administration still opposes a pact to protect plant and animal species. The U.S. is increasingly isolated at the summit, but President Bush, who heads for Rio tomorrow, says he has no apologies for his environmental policies and accomplishments. One other issue under discussion in Rio, how to preserve forests. But in Brazil, home to immense rainforests, there are those who are not adamant about saving them. CNN's Marina Mirabella reports. When most people think of the Amazon rainforest, they think of this or this, or perhaps even this. Picture perfect images of a vast forest and its exotic inhabitants. But the Amazon also has sights and sounds that are very familiar. This is Manaus, a bustling city located in the heart of the rainforest. More than a million people live in this industrial capital. They manufacture everything from motorcycles to computer parts. The governor here in the state of Amazonas calls this progress and wants to see more of it. We think that we can develop and utilize the riches of the forest in the benefit of the quality of life of our people. Gilberto Mestrino is a controversial politician who believes the rainforest should be exploited to feed the poor. He's hated by many ecologists, but has immense support in both the cities and in remote areas of the Amazon, where he's been elected governor three times. It's in small jungle villages like this one, where the governor is most popular, and there are thousands of these riverside settlements throughout the state of Amazonas. Peasants like Carlos de Silva struggle to feed their families by farming on tiny plots of land. De Silva says he's been helped by Mastrino, who's given him tools and seed. So, so. There are more than 10 million people living in Brazil's Amazon forest. Mastrino and his supporters say the outside world has no right telling them what to do. Despite the criticism, most of the forest in the state of Amazonas is still intact. But as the Brazilian recession worsens, the threat to the rainforest grows. As thousands in cities like Manaus are thrown out of work, they look to the Amazon for a way to survive and to their governor for support. Between man and a tree, I prefer man. And I will stand with him. Messrinho argues that the Amazon is Brazil's best resource in the fight against poverty. 
And when it comes to the politics of the rainforest, the local people will always come first. After all, the trees don't vote. Marina Mirabella, CNN, in the Amazon rainforest of Brazil. A Florida man says the dentist who infected Kimberly Burgalis with the AIDS virus may have done so on purpose. Edward Parsons told the Palm Beach Post that his friend, dentist David Aker, thought mainstream America was ignoring the AIDS epidemic. Parsons says Aker may have infected Kimberly Burgalis and four other patients to show that anyone can get AIDS. Burgalis died of AIDS-related illnesses in December at age 23. Health officials had suspected Aker infected his patients on purpose. In the hopes there will be never be another body buried in the tomb of the unknowns, the Army starts taking genetic fingerprints from its GIs. A report when the world today returns. And the Bulls and Blazers warm up for Game 4 of the NBA playoffs. Ron Hyde is next with sports. Panasonic presents a new breed of smooth operator. The new smooth operator rechargeable razor unites the old-fashioned closeness of a warm, wet shave with the convenience and no-nick comfort of an electric. Don't try this with any plugged-in razor. Smooth operator wet-dry razors from Panasonic. Smoother than you ever thought you'd be. So you get to go to Asia on business for two weeks. I'll try to call you every day. Try? It's not always easy overseas. Well, I'm going to make it easy for you. USA Direct. AT&T USA Direct service. Another way AT&T can help you from practically anywhere. Every country you're going to has a special number. You just dial it and get right back here to an AT&T operator. And more importantly, me. For a free USA Direct information card, call 1-800-874-4000. I love junk food. Sometimes even I get constipation. Now, x -Lax pills give you three choices. Regular, extra gentle, or new maximum relief. x -Lax, for regular people who sometimes aren't. I smoke, but with my kids in the car, smoking's curbed. No big deal. I've got Wrigley Spearmint Gum. That cool, clean taste is a family favorite. When I can't smoke, I enjoy pure chewing satisfaction. <laughs> 